Hi, and thank you for joining us. My name is Sharon Golan, and I am Director of Video Licensing at Infobase. Today, I'm joined by Katya Soldak to speak about her film, The Long Breaker. Hi, Katya. Hi, hi, thank you for having me here. Thank you for joining us. Um, I just watched the film, The Long Breakup, and it really put into context what we're seeing in the news right now. The film illustrates very clearly the, that the current conflict between Russia and the Ukraine is a continuation of decades long struggle between these peoples and countries, as well as disagreeing factions within the countries. Um, as a Ukrainian American and journalist specializing in the post-Soviet region, uh, you are uniquely positioned to discuss what we're seeing in the news today. So first and foremost, I have to ask, how are your friends and family? How are they faring? Have you heard from them? Is everybody safe? Thank you for asking this question because it, it is one of the most pressing and difficult questions right now. And I received a lot of messages from people who saw the film asking and following up on what happened, what is happening right now to people the characters in the film. So I have to tell you that today, finally, I was able to breathe and take a pause because my family safely left Ukraine and now they are in Romania trying to figure out um, the next steps. They didn't want to leave, even though I was warning them. And when the war started, there were a couple of days at the beginning when Kharkiv, my hometown where the family lives, was relatively quiet. There was no military actions or airstrikes, and they thought that it will pass. No one could really believe that this real big war with a lot of uh, military, heavy military machinery and airstrikes and shelling will begin. But uh, me and my sister, we both live in the United States, so we were asking them to leave. And at the very last moment, they just got into the car and started driving right when the tanks were coming into Kharkiv and passing wow. through major streets. And then they saw some military planes in the air. So they were driving towards the West, just like many other Ukrainians during the past couple of days. And they crossed the border to Romania. My friends, the ones who were in the film, at least two of them, uh, Natasha and Ira. Um, Ira right now is on a train to the west side of Ukraine. It's a train where you know, hundreds of people are cramped. They're sitting on the floor. They're just trying to get to the area where they won't be hit by any missiles. And my friend Natasha, she's in Kharkiv with her family, with three kids and her husband and a cat and in the house. And the bombs are falling. The missiles are hitting right outside of their home. So it's a very tragic moment. And I wish my country, Ukraine, would never have to go through anything like this. No country should go through anything like this. But right now, they're targeting all these big cities with a lot of residential buildings. And it's clearly out of control. And it's very painful to watch. Yeah, it's very, very scary, as much for us who don't have people, but even more so for people like you who have people that they know in the country. Um, and I think that this dovetails nicely into my next question, which is that this film is clearly very personal. Not only does it feature your family and friends, but it incl includes footage and, and interviews that were filmed 20 years ago or even more. Did you know that you were always going to make this film? And what was your motivation for making the film? I am, I guess, by nature, is a documentarian. I don't know why I was collecting a lot of uh, video cassettes from the TV station where I used to work in the 90s when I was still in college and I was working as a journalist for a TV station. But I labeled all of them, I dubbed them. Then when I moved to the United States, I transfer them from PAL to American system. So I never knew how I would use them, but I knew that I had to preserve that. I also did not have any historic percep percep uh, perspective at that time because I was 20, you know, you don't understand. You just live your life. You don't understand what Ukraine is going through. That is just the first years of independence. I kind of knew it, but I really didn't understand how important it was. Uh, to frankly, at that time, I didn't even realize that I was working for the first independent media outlets in Ukraine after 
decades of Soviet control and Soviet propaganda. I was just working and having fun and reporting about things, but I still wanted to save some of the newspaper clips and some of the tapes. So the film idea happened when Ukraine was going through the Orange Revolution in 2004. And even then I didn't know I was going to use all of that material, but I still kept piling things up and saving things. And uh, when the revolution in 2004 happened, a friend of mine suggested, she's, she's also a journalist, she said, maybe we can go to Ukraine and just make a film. And I said, yeah, sure, let's go. And that was the beginning of a very, very long journey that between 2005 and 2020, when I finally completed and released the film, it was about 15 years of documenting, trying to figure out what the story is like. And um, eventually it came together. But the idea of the film, you know, it came, it came to to me such a long time ago, and it was very different from the final outcome. Mm-hmm. You were a born journalist. <laughs> I don't know; it just kind of happened, you know. <laughs> well, it is fantastic. Um, I also have to be honest with you. You know, this film it it became kind of like my lifetime work because. I also like a lot music and arts and like, you know, stuff that is not political or historic. And many times I thought, oh, I wish I could just make a film about like, I don't know, some rock music in the 90s or in the 80s in the Soviet Union. That would have been great. But then there is this understanding that I'm uniquely positioned, as you say, or it looks like it's a good way to put it to tell a story that no one else can. I lived in Ukraine at that time. I have the footage. I have the drive. I know how to shoot and I have contacts. So I just kept going back to Ukraine and documenting and conducting interviews. And that's how I ended up with all of this, you know, all of that material that made the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, And we're beneficiaries of that now. Um, And the film does document your evolution and your family's evolution in terms of your feelings about being Ukrainian as opposed to Russian or Soviet. Uh, You were born under the Iron Curtain and started off as a child believing in the Soviet ideals, whereas today, according to your film, you're a proponent of Ukrainian self-determination. Can you speak a bit about how the current conflict is affecting your views? The current conflict... um... I think it's mostly just a manifest to the entire world that Ukraine is a nation and we exist and it's about 40 million people and for 30 years since the Soviet Union collapsed 30 years ago in 1991, Ukraine was becoming more and more of a separate nation because during the Soviet time, the Soviet Union put a lot of effort into propaganda and control and killing national identity of republics that uh, that were making up the Soviet Union, 15 different republics. All of them are unique countries. They all have separate history, separate languages. Everything was very unique and separate before the Soviet Union became sort of like started unifying everything and suppressing their countries. And Ukraine was very unfortunate to be a target of all of that, even before the Soviet Union the eastern part of Ukraine was under the Russian rule and they also put a lot of effort into into getting rid of Ukrainian identity and uh, ruining Ukrainian sovereignty and statehood. But the Soviet Union was even more brutal because the repressions were very targeted and in 1930s there was a whole campaign, basically genocide, called Holodomor, artificial hunger that killed millions of Ukrainians and also they got rid of a lot of intellectuals and elites. So after it all ended, the country started coming back to its cultural roots, which was not easy because a lot of people, you know, didn't know the history. For seven decades, somebody is teaching you, for instance, that the World War II started on June 22nd in 1941. That's a lie. This is not true. But a lot of people in the former Soviet Union, even now probably, doubt that. They still think that the war started when Germany attacked the Soviet Union, and they don't know anything about the 1939, all that time. So, you know, simple facts about 
the national identity and culture and history, they were just not existent. And if people would try to educate Ukrainians about that, it would come across as some kind of nationalistic movement, but it's not true. It's just trying to bring history back to some simple facts that were erased. So it took a long time for Ukrainians to accept for different people it would come in a different way for me it was a little bit sooner than for other people it's not in the film but i i know that the first time i came to the united states in the 90s i would never say that i was a russian even though i was from the eastern part of ukraine my native language was russian i could speak ukrainian i could you know read and speak and understand ukrainian but it was still very early in the ukrainian independence but because I was young and I was abroad, these things came sort of like, they became very apparent to me. Like I cannot say that I'm from Russia and I cannot say that Moscow is my you know, capital. So in, the, like in 1998, I had to tell people I'm from Ukraine and explain to them that Ukraine is a separate country for, to those who didn't know. And you know, that seals my identity as a Ukrainian. But I was, for instance, intimidated if I met some Ukrainians from Ukrainian diaspora from Canada or from the United States who speak Ukrainian because they were born and raised in the States and they went to Ukrainian Sunday schools and their Ukrainian language was very fluent and I really didn't have it like that. And I didn't know a lot of artists or like some history, some music history, some history of some literature the way they did because I was, I went to school to the Soviet school until I was 13. And even though they changed the program after that, a lot of like all this Soviet, you know, propaganda stuff, it was in my head. So I also had to go through some transformation, but it was a little bit ahead of people in Ukraine because I was sort of forced to do it here in the United States because I'm exposed to a lot more and, you know, you have to evolve much quicker. And seeing Ukrainians in 2014, demolishing all the Soviet symbols and getting rid of Lenin, it was eye-opening because a lot of people from Eastern and Central Europe, they would ask me, but why were these symbols still there? We all got rid of them in like 1989. And then you start thinking, really, why were they there? This giant Lenin that's standing in a big square used to stand in a big square in Kharkiv. Why was he there in 2014? Mm -hmm. I mean, 2013, and then they demolished it. All of that, you know, it makes up for pride for your national identity for your decisiveness to leave the soviet symbols and history and everything behind and ukraine succeeded big time in it and this current conflict it's almost like it's almost laughable because even for the past mm -hmm. seven or eight years since ukraine became independent the nation came together you know they're very much aware of who they are and what they want to do they want to have a democratic western oriented society they travel freely to europe you know they're beautiful wonderful people who like liberties of the western world they don't need a czar they don't need a strong ruler like you know some neighboring countries belarus and russia and in this current conflict it's almost like um it's almost strange to see how ukraine is not how, how, how this country is even trying to you know destroy this other country because clearly there are two different nations who are at this point at least headed in very different directions and the national identity of ukrainian people plays a huge huge role here today yeah um, but I think I think what you illustrate in the film is that it maybe wasn't always like this, and you've talked a bit about this in your answer. Um, you had the 1919 Bolshevik Revolution where Ukraine did declare independence, um, but it was short-lived. Then in 1991, Ukraine declared independence again, um, and the people did vote overwhelmingly to separate from Russia. Uh, in 2004, people, people took to the streets of Kiev to protest the election and pro-Western candidate Yushchenko, who won in the re-election. And then in 2014, the Russian-aligned president Yanukovych was ousted by parliament. So there's been this constant sway back and forth at times. The Ukraine is 
um, strongly under Russian influence. At times, it's moving more to the West. Um, do you think that is what we're seeing today in this conflict, a sway back to uh, Russian control? Absolutely. I think the events of the Maidan revolution in 2014, they fundamentally changed the picture. Until there was blood in the streets and until people were actually fighting for their land, I think they were more inert. Even though Russia constantly interfered in the media space and constantly worked on trying to sway public opinion and um, create some argument between the people, whether it should be one language or two languages, whether Ukraine should be with the EU or with or Ukraine cannot exist with Russia, all of these you know points, they were constantly massaged during any election or preparation for election. It, it was usually forced by Russians, but people were not really sensitive to that they were like okay sure russia is our brotherly nation that's fine i have relatives in russia that's fine but when the country when ukraine became in danger like it came to this point where it was attacked i know now we talk about ukraine being attacked and everybody's paying attention but ukraine has been attacked in 2014. crimea was annexed it was not a referendum. It was annexed by operation orchestrated by special forces coming from Russia under the supervision of Russian generals and everything. It was annexed. It's a big part of, you know, it, the international law was broken and it happened. And then around the same time, Eastern territories of Donbass were also occupied under slightly different, you know, sauce with like slightly different, you know, terms, but they were occupied, same thing, by Russian military services. And since then, Ukraine felt like Russia was attacking. Maybe it didn't become a huge international scandal or maybe for a moment and then it was forgotten, but people whose brothers and fathers and husbands were fighting in Donbass, they knew what was going on. And it's not that simple to hide that. So right now, it, nobody's getting under Russian control. I want to make it very clear, contrary to what it may look like, these people are going to fight till the very end. They can send whatever, you know, military forces, but people do not want anybody from the East to come and control them and tell them what they want to be. In the past, I'm sure that between 1918, when Ukraine briefly were in, was independent, and 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, I'm sure that there were moments when things were also getting very bloody and difficult, and Ukraine didn't want to be under Russia's control. But that was the nature of the Soviet Union. Most of these republics if not all of them, I can't speak for all of them, but nobody wanted to be under Russian control. There was a lot of effort put into killing people, sending military forces to occupy. My very own grandfather was an occupier in Lithuania. They have no idea now that they were occupiers. They thought that they were just friendly. Everybody was friendly. They, when I asked my grandmother, I said, what do you think people thought of you guys? Because they were military people stationed to keep the control over Lithuania. And, they, and she would say, we build an opera house for them. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> maybe you do. That's what they wanted, an opera house. <laughs> yes. So I'm sure that it, it was not that simple to, to keep Ukraine under control for all these years. And since 1991, I think it was more of a sort of like the economy was collapsing. So many things needed to be taken care of that this whole like spike of uh, national identity, it maybe was among some people, but overall it was just surviving. And in 2005, it was only 15 years into Ukrainian independence. People didn't want to, to continue this way. It's just, it was not as acute, you know, like the president in 2005, the potential president who became the president, Viktor Yushchenko, he was poisoned. I mean, there were some pretty brutal forces at play 
to, to keep things the same. And then between 2000, the Orange Revolution and Maidan Revolution, based on my conversations with historians, and including that historian who is in my film, Timothy Snyder, he does say that it's proven that there were a lot of um, consultancy and very you know, serious efforts coming from Russia to target Ukrainian um, sovereignty and kind of mess with the information and make people, you know, change their opinions and things. So just because people were not united the way they are united right now, it doesn't mean that it was a natural process. It was also instigated and influenced by, by, by Russian, by, by Russian side. So right now it's just one country attacked by another country without any reason fighting, fighting, I mean, I've never seen anything, I mean, not me, we have, we have never seen anything like this, what's happening right now. And based on what I see and what I hear, people are not gonna give up. And they certainly do not need anybody to tell them how they want to live and what their nation is called and what language to speak. This is it. Yeah, and, and you do cover this a little bit in the documentary. Um, that there have been movements to try and, and stir up divisions between the east of the country and the west of the country. Uh, and you actually travel in, in the film, you travel to the west and you travel to the east and, and you interview people to see what their opinions are of, of the people on the other side of the country. Um, do you think that uh, the availability of, of news and um, social media have also had an impact on the way that uh, Ukrainians think of themselves and the way that this conflict is uh, bearing out? I think social media in general impacted our society in a very profound way. On one hand, it gives a lot of information to people who want to find the information. On the other hand, if you find a channel where opinions totally in line with yours, you, you stick to it and you read only the same stuff and you have no idea what exists outside of your bubble. So that's a downside of it and it allows for manipulation and it allows for creating an even bigger division between groups of people and opinions. And of course, you know, a lot of different groups with different agendas are using it to their own advantage. But also having access to information it does allow people to, to look at things and spread things also when something happens and they post something, you know, it can be manipulated when there is some kind of an explosion, somebody can say whatever they want to say and post it on social media and there is always going to be somebody who never checks the sources and believes what they see. So it's just creating a little bit more mass, but I still think that having that available makes, makes it also a little bit more diverse and easier for people to get information it, you know it's it's not that kind of simple to 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 answer this question because a lot of bad stuff can be done by manipulating social media and information but also good stuff is available and one thing and we all know that even from our experience here in the united states over the past four five six years you have to check your sources. You just have to go and see where it comes from, who puts this information. Is it a credible outlet or is it some, you know, whoever just putting, you know, captions and creating a lie. And, you know, usually like two plus two is four and you know that and if someone keeps telling you that it's five, it's not a fact. So same thing when someone is imposing an idea, let's say they would say like right now, and it's very dangerous, I don't even want to repeat it, but I repeat it now with a disclaimer that it's a lie. It is a lie when the Russian president is saying that there is some kind of genocide is happening in Ukraine, that some neo-Nazis from Kyiv or from Western Ukraine are coming and killing Russian people or Russian speaking people and Russia is coming to save them because it is what they're saying right now. They used to say it eight years ago, but it sort of faded out. But now they bring in it back and amplify it by using national television and all these powerful, they have a lot of money in media that they invested to amplify their propaganda voice. So they're doing it, but it's a lie. 
it's a simple lie. It's not one side. It's not somebody like a little bit of truth. It's just a fabricated lie. And it's very important to remember that. And I think American media already knows that. So they, they're not giving the voice to, to these, uh, you know, propaganda machine people. But in the past, it could become an issue too. They would say, okay, there is one side, there is another side. Maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. In that case, this is not, you know, even remotely um, realistic. It's just lying and it should not be repeated ever. That's why I said I use a disclaimer. And I talk about it a little bit in my film too. Actors are hired to speak on TV, locations. Sometimes journalists already know, or student journalists, I mean, they already know that there's gonna be an explosion. So they come, they wear helmets, they're prepared, but they knew about it because someone called them and said, there's gonna be some fight, you have to shoot it. And the fight is orchestrated by somebody who wants to make it look like there is some oppression or something. You know, it's, it's a whole separate topic. And I hope I answered your question or at least stayed, stayed on, on topic. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, one other aspect of this question uh, that I'm interested in is whether you think that uh, there's been a lot of protest against what Russia is doing through social media. Do you think that this would have any influence on Putin at all? On Putin? <laughs> I knew, you know, if anybody knew, I'm sure he's not surfing the web, <laughs> Twitter and Telegram. Someone else is probably doing it for him and giving him just the right information, the one that he wants to see, at least that's the common opinion, because otherwise maybe some of the decisions would have been different. It clearly does not include the new reality of Ukraine not being interested in being part of anything other than free West with Western liberties. But in terms of organizing people and making people realize certain things, it's not that that easy you know i know that a lot of russians they're still not very well aware of what's going on this i mean i'm talking about like there are millions of russians right there are like 300 million people or how many 150 i, I forgot what population of russia is and like You're putting every, me on the spot here i don't know <laughs> like in every big country you know there are different pockets of society so mm -hmm. there are groups of very large groups of people where they really believe what Russian television is saying. And then there are people who are actually active on Twitter and Facebook and they try to get some truth and whatever message they hear, and as long as it brings them closer to some facts, I think it's very important. And people try to come out on the streets and protest, but Russia has been very brutal to protesters. They arrest them, they throw them to jail. People are really afraid and it's been going on for more than a decade now when the first protests happened in 2011 uh, when Russia re-elected or kind of re-elected Putin there were a lot of young people not even young just any people who came out into the streets to protest and then many of them ended up in prison for years I think that was the first real attempt to put somewhat liberalized society under control and since then for 10 years they were showing to people if you come out you're going to be in jail some of the leaders were killed like Nemtsov for instance Boris Nemtsov or Navalny has been poisoned so uh, Russians are not going to just come out like we come here in Times Square with flags and protests if they do they really know that it's very very dangerous so in social media, people can go in, if in Russian sphere. If somebody likes their own kind of post, they can also end up in jail. It's, it's a society that was uh, based on a lot of fear at the moment, the control of this society. But still, to spread the word about what's happening in Ukraine, to show very graphic pictures, even right now as we speak in Kharkiv right now, there are airstrikes, there are or maybe not their strikes, like some kind of shelling, some kind, kind of missiles are hitting into the residential buildings. You see a couple of videos of that, raw video without any manipulation. You really start thinking what is happening. Or there is a video of Ukrainian woman standing 
on the road in some rural side of Ukraine and speaking to a Russian military person who is asking her, show me your passport. And this woman without anything, she's a young woman without any weapons, she's just saying, who are you? I'm not going to show it to you. And he holds, you know, the gun and there are other people with guns and there is a tank behind him. And he keeps saying, like, show me your passport. And she says, I'm not supposed to show it to you. You came here. This is my land. I'm not showing it. So this absolutely fearless person, you know, you can try to control information or send wrong messages. If you watch something like this, you can come to your own conclusions about something, but at least it's going to be a, a way to, to make up your opinion that's closer to what's going on, as opposed to the message that comes from the government and is heavily controlled, like on Russian national television. Yeah, well, we can only hope, right? <laughs> so um, what do you think the future of Ukraine is, both in the short term and the long term? Well, predictions are not usually, you know, a very good thing to do because <laughs> you really don't know. In this case, it's gone so far. No one can ima could imagine uh, other than in some crazy, very negative dreams that it would happen like that, that one country is going to attack another country that did not provoke anything, but also in such a brutal way. You know, they're not just like shooting a little bit somewhere in the fields. They're actually hitting cities and show that they can destroy cities. So it's very hard to go from here and imagine what would happen. But I still think that Ukraine has a wonderful, beautiful future. I do not think that this is somehow going to stop Ukraine from being a great country that develops in a direction that it wants to develop. The enemy will be gone and the people of Ukraine will rebuild Ukraine. They will rebuild all these destroyed buildings and it's, it's going to be a life that Ukraine and Ukrainian people deserved all these years and centuries. And I don't know how easy the road to that is going to be and how much more suffering is going to happen. But this nation that survived so many difficult moments in history is still alive and fighting. I, I would say that the future is, is there and this future is right. So you think the cycle will end? No, I just know that you can't kill this nation. This is all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katya. This was a really stimulating discussion. Um, and I'm sure that our viewers will also benefit from watching this interview. And of course, from watching The Long Breakup, which is available both on Films On Demand and on Access Video On Demand. Um, you do have to be a subscriber to access the film. So if you're not, you can sign up for a free trial. Thank you again, Katya. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me talk about the film and about Ukraine. Absolutely.